Hello, welcome to this course, Basics of Physics and Chemistry for Biology students. I am Ranjit Padnyatiri from the Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay in Mumbai. In this module of lectures, we will discuss about thermal energy versus other energies. In this set of lectures, we will answer an important question that why do we need thermodynamics or statistical mechanics to understand biology? This is the question that we will try to answer. At the end of today's lecture and a bunch of a set of lectures, it will be clear to you the need of thermodynamics and how to use thermodynamics or statistical thermodynamics to study biological systems. So let's start. So when you hear the word force and energy, the notion that comes to your mind is historically we have heard of gravitational force, Newton, 1700 onwards, right? So you would think of like lifting a heavy object or something falling, like apple falling or stone falling. You have heard of magnets repelling and attracting forces and energies. As a biologist, when you listen energy, the immediate thing that would come to your mind is the food, energy from the food we eat, like the calories we burn. We have heard of, also heard of like solar energy, wind energy. We have also heard of spring energy, for example, the energy to pull a spring, which is basically the elastic energy. And also electricity and light comes to your mind, right? So these are the things that comes to your mind as a lay person. But as an academic, when you hear the word energy as a student, typically something that one has learned, we have learned is potential energy and kinetic energy. All of us have learned. We have also heard words like internal energy, enthalpy, free energy, and in particular, Gibbs free energy, Helmholtz free energy, etc. Many of you have heard this, but it may not be absolutely clear what do they actually mean. So in this set of lectures, we would very clearly define all this. We will help you understand what this in a different energies mean. What does internal energy, what does free energy, how they are different and how to compute them, how to calculate them for a biological system of your interest. So we'll take some biological systems of interest and we will teach you to, we'll help you to compute, calculate free energy of the system. So that is what we expect to you to learn by the end of this module of lectures. So in today, we are going to talk about electrostatic energy and thermal energy. So something that you all know is that if you take two charges, either two positive charges or two negative charges, they ripple, but the electrostatic potential energy is can be computed based on the ideas developed by Charles Augustine de Coulomb, which is like somewhere around 18th century, late 18th century. So we know that the Coulomb energy, that's the subscript C, starts for Coulomb. So EC is Q1, Q2 divided by 4 pi epsilon 0, epsilon R, R, where Q1 and Q2 are the charges and Epsilon zero, epsilon r are permittivities, and r is the distance between those two charges, right? Two charges are distance apart. The energy is given by this formula that we all know. Now, the question is, how big is this energy? What is the amount of this energy? So two unit charges, if we take in water, which is the medium relevant to biology. So let us take two unit charges in water, and how big is this interaction energy? We want to compute this. We want to put, the, put in numbers and compute. So some an, an important point that I want all of you to get used to in this course is to put numbers. Instead of, we will certainly will have formulas and we will have ideas, but all of these ideas will be relevant if you put appropriate numbers. So we would try and put numbers wherever possible. If it is not done in this, set of lectures, but you should go back yourself uh, and try yourself these numbers. So let us take two unit charges in water and ask the question, how big is the interaction energy between this? 
So let us take for simplicity q1 is equal to q2 is equal to a unit charge E. So the unit charge E is, if you can go back and look at books, it will be approximately 1.6 into 10 power minus 19 Coulomb. Coulomb is again the unit of charge named after the scientist Coulomb. So the, in the, the formula is q1, q2 by 4 pi epsilon 0 epsilon r r and 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0, again all of these are constant. If you put in SI units, it is approximately 9 into 10 power 9, the something that we know. And for water, the relative permittivity is 80 in SI units. So let us substitute all these numbers. What we get is some constant, all these numbers divided by R. So this constant, which is K, which is stands for 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0 epsilon R. If we compute after putting all these numbers, you would get 3 into 10 power minus 30 in SI units divided by R, if I put in meters, which is the distance in meters, and the energy I would get is in joules. So it is 3 into 10 power minus 30 divided by R. So it decreases like 1 over R. I want you to also to plot this 1 over R and see how the graph would look like. If there are positive charges, it will decrease, right? And if there one is the negative charges, uh, you, you should try and see how this graph would look like energy versus distance graph, right? Okay, so now if I take R, some value, a value relevant in biology. So if you take biomolecules, the typical distance between charges in biomolecules is of the order of nanometers. So DNA, order of nanometers, protein charges would be roughly of the order of nanometers between amino acids, the 3D distance between two amino acids, right? So if I substitute roughly of the order of nanometers, which is 10 power minus nine meter, the energy is basically three into 10 power minus 21 joule. So this is what we would get, an interesting number. And I want all of you to remember this order of magnitude, 10 power minus 21 joule. So this number would come very many times in this course. So I want all of you to remember this number, this order of magnitude, which is 10 power minus 21 joule. This has a lot of significance and it's a very interesting number. If we convert this 10 power minus 21 joule to kilocal per mole, which is the unit that we often use in biology and chemistry, right? So then this would turn out to be about half kilocal per mole, which is easy to remember. So the energy of two unit charges in water, when they are about one nanometer away is half kilocal per mole, roughly half kilocal per mole. Now, immediately we should think, how big is this number compared to other energies that you know? So you can think of energy of a hydrogen bond. And you will see that they, it is also of the order of kilocal per mole, a few kilocal per mole, same, roughly same order. Now, you can also take other bonds, covalent bond and all that, they would be much bigger. So I want you to compare this with other numbers that you know, how big is this energy compared to other energies that you are aware of. So this is the electrostatic potential energy and the computer we know. Now let us go to kinetic energy. And in this context of biology, kinetic energy is related to temperature. And I'm going to explain how. Something that you have probably learned is that if you take gas molecules in this room, or if you think of ideal gas in this room, right? And if you compute the average kinetic energy of these gas molecules, it turns out that that average kinetic energy would be three by two times a constant called Kb, which is the Boltzmann constant, which is a number times the temperature. So the average kinetic energy is basically proportional to temperature and the proportionality constant is a number. This is basically comes from ideas developed by a bunch of scientists uh, called known as kinetic theory of gases by Boltzmann, Maxwell, and many others in the period of like roughly like 1850s to 1900, like around the, the period, the second half of 19th century, roughly the time when Darwin and uh, others lived, right? 
So Mendel and Darwin, since we as a biology course, it's important to, interesting to compare the time period where this developed with other developments in biology, the Darwin's and, uh, and genetics of Mendel roughly in this period. Okay, so what does this say, this idea? This idea says that temperature is basically associated with random motion of molecules. So the gas molecules in this room are randomly moving. This randomly moving gas molecules, for example, they come and collide us. And that is what leads to temperature. So in this picture, the blue dots are representing gas molecules. And this red arrows represent their motion in random directions. They are moving with different velocities. And you can calculate the kinetic energy, which you know, half mv square. So we can calculate half mv1 square plus v2 square plus v3 square. There are n molecules, vn square divided by n. That's the average. So if we compute this average kinetic energy, that is a constant times temperature. In other words, if I divide this average kinetic energy by that constant 3 by 2 kb, I would get the temperature. That's how one can define the temperature. You might have a kind of red temperature is the degree of hotness and so on and so forth. But quantitatively precisely defining temperature is this way. It is basically the average kinetic energy of gas molecules in this room divided by a constant gives you the temperature. The more the kinetic energy, the more the temperature. If temperature is zero, everything will freeze and nothing will move and which is not possible to attain. But as you reduce the temperature, the kinetic energy would decrease or vice versa. When we say we are reducing the temperature, we are reducing the random motion of molecules in this room. Okay, so that is the basic understanding of temperature, which basically comes from kinetic energy of molecules. This is also true in water. So if you take water, the water molecules also is randomly jiggling. What is shown in this um, animation here, which is an animation I took from Wikipedia, which for, for example, you can get the GIF file from the Wikipedia link given there. The black dots are kind of representing water, the medium, right? Let us take it as water. And if these water molecules are randomly moving because of temperature. So the temperature is associated with random motion. Whenever, the, when the temperature is finite, non-zero, there would be random motion of water molecules, right? We may not be able to see them with naked eyes, but they are moving. And this random, not only that they are randomly moving, this randomly jiggling water molecules can kick other molecules in the in water. For example, if you put protein molecules in water, they would get kicked by this randomly moving water molecules. Or if you put some dust particles, they will also get kicked. Anything you put in water or even air for that matter gets kicked by this randomly moving molecules. And this kick would also make this bigger molecules also move around. For example, the yellow ball like molecules like a macromolecule much much bigger than the size of the water molecule and they also kind of randomly move around because they get kicked by this randomly moving water molecules and this random movement is important idea that it is because of thermal fluctuations so this is a very important idea it's crucial to understand many things diffusion chemical reaction biology in many fields of engineering and science it's a very important idea, the idea of thermal fluctuation, which essentially says that at a finite temperature, the medium, the water or the air molecules are randomly moving. These randomly moving water molecules can kick any other molecules in the medium, in water. And if they are of a particular size, they will also move around. And this idea is essentially known as Brownian motion, the movement of that yellow balls, essentially, we would call it, it is called the Brownian motion. Basically, from the observation of a scientist, Robert Brown. So in about 80, around 1827, a botanist, Robert Brown, he was looking 
pollen grains under a microscope and he saw that this pollen grains are moving around the small objects they are moving around in water and he didn't understand why they are moving around he first thought that they are moving around because they are living objects so life is what causing this motion but then later he saw dust particles or in some dead objects as well and he saw them also moving so he famously wrote that let me read extremely minute particles of solid matter whether obtained from organic or in our inorganic substances when suspended in pure water or in some other aqueous fluids exhibit motions for which i am unable to account so he didn't understand this why they are moving but he observed that they are moving and it took many years like so almost uh, einstein is who fully understood this so it's like almost 100 years or uh, 80 years it took for people to understand this brownian motion uh, fully right so today we understand that the reason is essentially the thermal energy the random jiggling of molecules they kick this bigger yellow particles and this energy of this kicks is known as the thermal energy so the obvious question is how big is this thermal energy what is the magnitude of this thermal energy so thermal energy is essentially the average kinetic energy which is approximately kbt where kb is the boltzmann constant t is the temperature so we can compute this we know the boltzmann constant which is the constant uh, which you can look at look up books and the temperature t let us take the room temperature let us say approximately 300 kelvin so we can do the math so at room temperature 300 kelvin kb which is 1.4 into 10 power minus 23 joule per kelvin in si unit times 300 kelvin will give you 4.2 into 10 power minus 21 joule again see that number 10 power minus 21 joule so as i said this will come again and again and if we convert this it's so approximately 0.6 kilo cal per mole so this random motion of this leads to thermal energy which kicks the protein molecules or other molecules in water and this kick is as powerful as 0.6 kilo cal per mole that is the energy that's average energy like some of the kicks can be slightly more powerful some of the kicks could be lesser powerful right so this is what this roughly the order of magnitude of this thermal energy now if we compare two energies that we learned the thermal energy is kb times tr where tr stands for room temperature which is 300 kelvin and then you would get 4.2 into 10 power minus 21 joule which is 0.6 kilo cal per mole the electrostatic energy that we computed is 3 into 10 power minus 21 joule which is about half kilo cal per mole which is comparable to kb tr so the thermal energy and electrostatic energy are comparable what does that mean that means that if you have two charges whatever they do the thermal energy can work against it for example if it is a positive charge and a negative charge the ther- the electrostatic energy will be the same is just that they would attract but the energy is the same right uh, now the magnitude the value of the energy is same so but if they come and attract you have this thermal energy with randomly kicking this charged molecules because of that they would get disrupted so this thermal energy can disrupt even electrostatic attraction if the charges are 1 nanometer of the order of 1 nanometer apart so this is an important idea this is an important point that electrostatic energy and thermal energy are comparable and thermal energy can disrupt electrostatic attraction in the length scale relevant to biology now what does that mean it also means that it can destabilize some bonds for example dna bonds like you can again go back and look at this hydrogen bonds they will be of the order of kilo cal per moles one or two bonds can easily be broken by thermal energy the whole set of bonds will not be broken at the same time but one or two base pairings can be broken by this thermal energy if you heat we know that dna will melt at higher temperature 
protein also will denature so at higher temperature this thermal energy is more powerful and they can denature the dna or denature the protein so this basic idea is also coming from the force of thermal energy is just that it will be more powerful so kbt at different temperatures you can compute and that would be the thermal energy and this can destabilize bonds therefore it is important to understand that and account that if you think of dna binding to proteins for example if you take nucleosomes which are dna wrap, uh, wrapped around histone octamers this wrapping of dna can also get disrupted partially the whole dna will not get disrupted it needs lot of energy but one or two bonds can get broken and the dna partially unwraps um, which has been seen experimentally by beautiful experiments by john meadow and others so this all say says that the thermal energy is powerful enough to partially destabilize many of the bonds and the energies of bonding and other energies they are comparable to the thermal energy and this and they can compete with each other and this competition is very crucial for life very crucial for chemical reaction very crucial for diffusion and because all of this together is what constitutes life so in this coming lectures we will try and understand these in detail one question that comes to one's mind is that when you say the energy is 10 power minus 21 joule what is the typical force associated with this thermal kicks so let us take 10 power minus 21 joule and write it we can write it as 10 power minus 12 times 10 power minus 9 so 10 power minus 9 is the nanometer which is the length scale relevant in biology we all know that energy is force times distance so if the distance is about of the order of nanometers the force has to be of the order of 10 power minus 12 newton which is a piconewton so if i just now take 1 kbt or 1 kbt at room temperature 1 kbtr that is approximately 4 piconewton nanometer so a few piconewtons is the force coming from thermal fluctuations so the typical force scale relevant in biology is of the order of pico newton and we would come and discuss this many times like we would come back and uh, explain this and understand this in more detail as we go ahead in this course this comes to the important point that since these two energies are comparable and they can compete we need a new branch of science called thermodynamics to understand this system so thermodynamics is essentially a branch of science that deals with thermal energy and other forms of energies electrostatic and all other forms of energies which we will discuss in this course as we go ahead so since thermal forces can compete with other forces we need thermodynamics to understand because thermodynamics basically understands this competition between thermal forces and other forces so other forces here we saw electrostatic forces we will see other forces more forces in the coming lectures so usually we used to use like newton's laws and mechanics to study systems right for example if you take a ball falling which is shown on the right hand side here if you take a ball let's say 1 kg ball and it falls down under gravity from a height of 1 meter the energy which we all know is mgh so if we can calculate that energy m is 1 kg g is about 10 in si unit like 9.8 which is approximately 10 and h is 1 meter here so then mgh is 10 and everything is si units so the u energy is 10 joule compare that with the energy that we computed which is 10 power minus 21 joule which is also the approximately the thermal energy so the energy for a ball to fall down if i drop a ball to describe the motion of that ball so the energy scale is much much larger than 10 power minus 21 joule much much larger than the thermal energy therefore we do not there is no competition between thermal energy and gravitational energy thermal energy cannot compete with 
gravitational energy so there is no need of accounting for thermal energy we can neglect thermal energy completely we have to only deal with the gravitational energy that's what that's why in newton's equations and newton's laws there is no temperature we would come back and a little bit talk about this there is no temperature in mechanics that we learn newton's laws right so we have to now introduce thermodynamics if we want to deal with biological systems because the scale the size and scale of the systems is such that the energy the important energy involved for example electrostatic energy is the most crucial energy in biology because all other interactions essentially stems essentially emerges from electrostatic interactions so when energy is involved in this problem in biological problems or in any problem is comparable to thermal energy we need to use ideas from statistical mechanics or thermodynamics so also often called statistical thermodynamics and we will learn these ideas so 10 power minus 21 joule is the typical energy scale which is comparable to thermal energy in other cases where the energy scale is much much bigger than 10 power minus 21 joule we can neglect thermal energy completely and we can only deal with that dominant energy alone and we will get reasonable answers we can predict things using that energy alone but here it is not possible here both are same scale we need to account for both we need a theory we need a we need equations and theory that accounts for thermal energy as well as electrostatic energy or other energies together so that is the message from this uh, particular lecture that i want to convey uh, if we take for example multiple charges let us say each charge is not 1e but 3e's then you compute it then you would get ec is about 10 times kbtr kbtr is about 3 into 10 4 into 10 power minus 21 joule so 10 times the thermal energy you would get which is an order of magnitude bigger so if there are multiple charges then this interaction could be much more powerful than the thermal energy because life everything if everything is broken by thermal energy life will not exist so you need a you need both right the thermal this is in the the boundary so you need thermal energy can influence a little bit but it cannot disrupt everything so there could be situations where energies are greater than thermal energy if the distances are very small instead of 1 nanometer they are in angstroms or uh, like uh, picometers tens of hundreds of picometers right then again the electrostatic energy would be 10 times the thermal energy if this is a smaller it could be even bigger so in that case again thermal fluctuations cannot disturb this energies so it is important and interesting to understand when thermal energy is important and how much what role it would play in chemical reactions in biology and in all the phenomena that is relevant for biology something that we would discuss in the coming lectures so to summarize we talked about electrostatic potential energy we talked about thermal energy which is also in relation to kinetic energy average kinetic energy of molecules in the medium and we said that thermal energy is comparable to electrostatic interaction energy and both are comparable of the order of 1 about a kilo cal per mole and it's also comparable to higher other bond energy something that you would go and convince yourself thermal energy can also disrupt some bonds they are forces are of the order of pico newtons and we learn that we require a branch of science called thermodynamics or statistical thermodynamics or statistical mechanics to understand this competition between thermal energy and other energies and which is very crucial for biology so we would come back and learn more about this in the coming lectures this all for this from this lecture thank you